We are making plant-based lifestyle medicine available to everyone who desires it. With telemedicine, we are removing barriers that prevent many people from accessing this type of care. Lifestyle medicine promotes healthy behaviors and when adopted, individuals can expect improvement and in many cases, reversal of chronic disease. Welcome to our live Q&A with Dr. Chris Miller, myself, Dr. Lori Marbus. We're from Plant-Based Telehealth, if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, if you want to check us out, plantbasedtelehealth.com. And we're always here every week. We're trying to answer as many of your questions as we can. And today we really like to focus on hypertension. Of course, we'll answer other questions, but if we try to pick a topic um, just so we can really start educating and do a little bit deeper than typically. So first of all, just a quick rundown on what actually hypertension is. Um, so hypertension is number one risk for death around the world, um, kills about 9 million people annually, which is very sad. And when you look at hypertension, some of the categories have changed. So normal is under 120, what we call that top number, a systolic blood pressure. Under 80 is a diastolic blood pressure, and that's normal. Even better if you can get under 115 uh, systolically. Now, what they figure is normal, like I said, is that 120 over 80. Then there's this elevated blood pressure. So that's that 120 to 129 on top, but still under 80 on the bottom. Then you have stage one hypertension. So this is a little different than some of the J and C guidelines that we had, which is something that doctors look at to see how we treat hypertension and how you stage it. But that's 130 to 139 on top and above 80 on the bottom. And then stage two is anything over 140 on top and above 90 on the bottom. So what just the numbers are real quick and then we'll dive in is that that systolic number is basically when your heart beats, the whole idea is all it is, it's just beating, beating, pumping out blood, then it rests between beats and it fills up with blood. So there's pressure that you can measure. It's called, and it's measured in mercury, excuse me, millimeters of mercury, as it's pressure exerted on arterial walls. So as the arteries take blood away from the heart, that's a good way, A is away. That's one of our new marks that we're learning in undergrad and in medical school, like A is away. Um, as the heart is contracting and it's pushing the blood into the aorta, the big artery that leaves the heart, that is where we're measuring that blood pressure is that top. So that's why that number is higher because it's actually pushing and contracting and pushing the blood flow out versus the diastolic or the bottom number is it's when the heart is not beating, it's resting between beats and it's refilling with blood. So that's the blood pressure that's being exerted, the pressure being exerted inside the arteries during that rest period. So that's what we call blood pressure. Systolic on top with the contraction, systole means contraction, diastole means relaxation, and it's not contracting. Um, and then just one last thing is when you're measuring your blood pressure, when they're listening, what they do is they pump up your, they literally cut off the blood pressure. So you have this artery here and we're listening and we pump, 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 pump it up. And we usually go about 20 to 30 millimeters before we, you don't hear it anymore. And then you slowly release the valve about two millimeters of mercury a second. And what we're listening for is the first sound. That's the top number. And then the very last sound we hear is the bottom number. So that's literally blood pressure in a very quick nutshell. So mm -hmm. <laughs> should we just, just should we, good did you add anything to that no that's great I think that's fantastic there's yeah well when I think that'll help understand as we start talking about treatment and management and why the numbers need to be a certain level so that's great perfect yeah because I was really before we dive into like oh well this drops your systolic blood pressure this much I was like well why don't we just set the ground with some basic definitions um but here we go we have some questions let's see here um, everybody said they like the time too, which is great. So can a whole food plant-based diet help with electrical abnormalities like AFib, atrial fibrillation, which is an irregularity, it's an arrhythmia. Um, yes, there is some evidence that there is. And if you look at the IJDRP, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention, um, we have an article that'll be probably being published later um, in a month or two. Um, as it goes through copying all that stuff. So Chris, do you have anything to say about AFib, um, particular maybe certain minerals and vitamins? That yeah, might be so helpful? AFib is extremely common. And um, the thing that's interesting about it is it happens for all sorts of different reasons. So 
Um, it can be related to heart failure. For, it can be from a heart attack. It can be due to electrolyte abnormalities. It can even be related to things like stress. Um, but basically what happens is the atria, instead of being that contracted beat, it gets, um, it fibrillates. So it gets like this. So um, it's not able to um, push blood into the ventricle and then get blood to the heart the way it's supposed to, as Lori had described. And so, um, but like I said, there's so many reasons that that can happen. It's not just one cause. So a whole food plant-based diet is optimizing your whole health and your whole health greatly affects the health of your heart. Of course it does. So by eating a fiber rich whole food plant-based diet, high in antioxidants, low in fat, low in saturated fat, and all these foods that we know affect the heart and the blood vessels, you are softening the blood vessels. So that's going to help this already start to contract. Um, if, if it's due to things like heart failure, if it's due to things like um, electrolyte abnormalities, that actually can start to improve with the whole food plant-based diet. And that's some of the article that, uh, that is in the IDJ, IJDRP journal, <clears throat> some of the patients that we see improving. So there have been patients that have significantly improved end results, AFib, but not everyone. If it's been permanent damage, if it's scarred along the electrical um, system, then that may not fully improve, but you're still benefiting because you're improving all the other risk factors that go with it. And there are significant risk factors such as stroke with AFib. So um, everything you do to help benefit is, is essential. So very optimistic with that one. Absolutely. Exactly right. And so... Um... One of my dear friends is a cardiologist who specializes in, you know, electrical interferences or you could say um, arrhythmias of the heart. And she's plant-based and truly believes it. Um, so really cool thing, guys, is to go to a whole food plant-based diet and just make sure you're optimizing potassium and magnesium in your diet as well. Um, so we have another question. I've got about four questions running around here. So the, this one is um, type one and a half strict plant-based fat under 20% for four months. Um, she says she's five foot four inches, 130 pounds. She says my blood sugar goes up 30, for 30 minutes after I take um, a Preta before it comes back down. So a Preta is a fast acting insulin. Um, typically, you know, these are working about 15 minutes after injecting and it peaks in about an hour and will last about two to four hours. So it's hard to say um, when you're taking it. So if you're taking it, you know, 15 minutes before a meal typically is what you do is you'll, you'll dose this 15 or 20 minutes, even before a meal you eat, and then you will have a spike and it may spike for a little bit, um, as the insulin is being utilized to bring the blood sugar down. So that's actually not uncommon. Um, so she's, she says she's taking it part eating. Okay. So again, it, I think it would depend on one, where's your blood sugar before you inject it. Um, and number two is what are you eating? And are you doing the carb insulin ratio? And so there's a lot of things that would be and kind of an intricacy, how high is it going? Um, so that would be a great one, honestly, for an appointment to discuss <laughs> specifically. But Chris, do you have any other thoughts on, on no, that? No, it, well? it has so much to do with where you are before your meal and what you're eating. I agree with that and how much you're exercising as well. Um, and how sensitive you are. So there's a lot of factors that would play in and that would help as you tweak all of those, you could get that um, in better control, so. Yeah, she says that it uh, doesn't matter what the number I'm at when it happens as soon as mm -hmm. I, I take the Aprita. So honestly, that's where maybe a continuous glucose monitor and you may already be doing that. So looking at the actual data and then when you're taking it and the food, she says she does CGM. So tested, I don't know what state you're in, but it would be awesome if you'd, consider making an appointment with us, we'd be happy to dive into that with you. Mm -hmm. um, can it be, can it be a liver, the liver? Um, that depends. So there's, again, there's a lot of things to focus on when you're looking at, especially type one and a half diabetic, which is a later onset autoimmune diabetes. And again, we'd want to look at your food logs when you're taking it, how much you may, you know, maybe even changing out to a different brand and see how you feel or do that. Um, so there's lots of options to consider there. And what time you're taking, exactly. Like sometimes tweaking mm -hmm. that even just can make a difference. Yep, exactly. Absolutely. And I'm working actually with one of my type one and a half right now, just about this exact issue. And um, they're seeing a huge spike and we're looking at what the blood sugars are before their carb insulin ratio. We're looking at how much they're taking, when they're taking it, and analyzing the data. So we're playing around with that and we're seeing some really nice results. So 
I'm going to go to the next one here. Thanks, Tess, for those. That's really helpful because I'm sure other people are having those questions yeah, as well. Yeah, a good question. Um, okay. Let's see here. Is, let me see. Sorry, I'm scrolling through lots of, oh, can you treat a bacterial infection naturally? Chris, I'll let you dive into that one while I start looking at these other questions here. Um, what kind of bacterial infection? That would sort of depend what you're talking about. But usually, if it's become bacterial that we know it's bacterial, that's when we use antibiotics. So I would say um, it's a little risky to not use antibiotics if it's a pneumonia, if we, if we suspect bacterial, if it's... Um, now, your body still has an immune system, and it still can mount a response. It definitely overcomes viruses. But um, by the time it's something like a... a um, a pneumonia or a cellulitis or something, you know, a bacterial a cellulitis is a skin infection. That's the point where I would use antibiotics. So exactly. Now, um, although I'm not sure what, what infection you're talking about. So maybe. Yeah, exactly. And then many times the bacterial infection, you do require antibiotics. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's know. a little risky not to at that point. But. Exactly. Um, but we do still have immune systems. So we do. And so all an antibiotic does is it augments, you know, what's occurring. The whole idea, hopefully, would just be avoid the bacterial infection to begin with. But sometimes that's not possible. You get the cut in your hands, right. you get exposed. So, right. I mean, things yeah, happen. That's one of the uh, miracles of modern medicine is antibiotics because people really did used to die of simple little bacterial infections, such as a skin infection or a dental infection, and people would die from this. And so we don't die from this anymore because thank God we have antibiotics. So, But antibiotic resistance is on a huge rise. So that actually we may be going backwards because um, now we're getting super bugs and all these things. The other thing is you look at the meat industry, they use 80% of antibiotic right. use in the, in, in the United States is used on animal agriculture. And it's not even necessarily to treat infections, it's to actually grow them fatter. So some really interesting work um, with antibiotics and what they do to us as humans. And you think about, you know, what's our gut bacteria. So, so much to consider. <laughs> but hopefully for most of us who are plant-based eaters or we're, you know, we're concerned about the environment or the animals and we're eating less and less and less, if any, animal products, if you do need those rare antibiotics, then you do need them. And you can, you know, work on your prebiotic food and your pro take some probiotics and build a healthy microbiome following antibiotics. Cause I know I have a lot of patients who are very resistant to wanting to take antibiotics and when it's needed, we still have to, you know, we still do need them. And so, but there's all sorts of things we can do afterwards to help restore the microbiome and get ourselves back in balance and um, have a healthy immune system following it. So. Exactly. Um, and then we have a couple of questions on cholesterol. So kind of moves into the, the cardiovascular system here. Um, Roz asked, are there any signs of cholesterol improvement following a whole food plant-based diet to look for other than via a blood test? Well, there's, they're all not necessarily invasive without a blood test, but they certainly could be, I mean, you look at your blood, no, I don't, I mean, is there any well, indicators it's a hard, that it's I'm- a I want to say that when people lose weight, their cholesterol almost always, always drops. Even if you lose weight from eating Twinkies every day, but you only eat one Twinkie a day, the cholesterol will usually drop. People on a ketogenic diet, cholesterol will drop on that short term while they're losing weight. And once they stay by, so I feel like saying, if you know you're losing weight, I almost always can see in my patients. Um, and my patients are so funny because they will- um, after three months, they've lost weight. They can't wait to go get their cholesterol checked. And, you know, I can, I can almost guarantee that if they've lost weight, it's going to be coming down. And hopefully we're doing it in a healthful way by doing a whole food plant-based diet or, you know, as my, in, working in that direction. So I feel like weight loss is something, but I don't, I can't say that with like. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you're looking for objective measurements, the only thing I'm aware of is is actual blood tests, but it is interesting because um, I've worked with some individuals who were morbidly obese, whose BMI is over 40. And when you look at their cholesterol, many times it's actually really low, which is unusual in the sense that you would think, oh, they're obese and they should have it. But from what I can find in the research is, is that their liver just can't keep up with the cholesterol demands. So they're actually probably have high cholesterol and as they lose weight, these super morbidly obese, we may see it trend upwards. That's the only caveat to that I've seen. Like you said, everyone else you lose weight, but it's like the super morbidly obese. Um, it's a little tricky there, but any, 
Yeah, very interesting. Um, it says here that someone was recommended uh, bergamot extract for reduction of LDL, which was you. Um, she started taking 500 milligrams twice a day. Any other recommendations? For high cholesterol, so um, I don't know anything about you, but if hopefully you're doing a whole food plant-based diet, lots of fiber, things like oats for breakfast, beans, legumes, leafy greens, berries, um, fi uh, flax, chia seeds. These are some of my standard lowering cholesterol type foods. Um, supplement wise, once you've maximized your diet, because that's always going to be the most beneficial because it's more than just lowering a cholesterol number. Remember, it's also preventing the cholesterol from getting oxidized. It's when the cholesterol is oxidized, not the actual number, the LDL become, becomes oxidized. That, that's when it deposits, it gets sticky and deposits to the blood vessel linings and causes us problems. And so, um, so the whole food plant-based diet is really good for all the antioxidants and all the nitrate dilating benefits of the, um, blood vessel. And so all of that is going to help the total picture. But if you still need some help, if you do have plaque, if you still have high numbers, if you're still at risk, um, bergamot is a good one. And then also we like, uh, amla powder, uh, more and more data is coming out about that now. Indian gooseberry being a high antioxidant and, um, significantly lowers both cholesterol and blood pressure. And it's recommended to start with about half a gram a day and go to one gram, two grams, three grams. And it can be just as powerful as a statin actually. Um, it is really bitter. So um, you have to- Very with, bitter. Yeah, how to get it into a smoothie or do a tea or we put it in just a little bit of almond milk and just kind of chug it and then chase it with our smoothie. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we get it in like that. But, um, but so that's another one that can be very beneficial for cholesterol. Um, and then you can also, also do things like stanols or sterols, um, which is a sort of a plant-based fiber and it helps pull cholesterol out. So you actually excrete it, you poop it out. So you're already getting so much fiber, which is what oats are doing and flaxseed and all your green vegetables and fruits, but um, adding something like the stanols or sterols, um, one to two grams a day can also help poop out a little bit extra. Um, and there's a few other little tricks, but those are, I would start with sort of those and really maximize your diet. Also, um, soy can also help lower cholesterol. So doing a little bit of the whole soy, like um, edamame, soybeans, tempeh, or tofu, um, those can all be helpful as well. So really Brazil, maximize your diet. Yeah, and then, and the um, Brazil nuts, probably yeah. two, two a week is all you need. To, and they think from what the research I can see, it's something to do with the high selenium. Um, so that would be two Brazil nuts and the amla, um, of course, ground flax seed, those type of things. So, I, yeah, I think, I think that's everything that you. And it depends what your cholesterol you're lowering too, because remember, things like alcohol are going to affect um, certain sure. cholesterols a little bit more. Nuts are going to increase your HDL, and um, if you have triglycerides, that's step probably related to your five, your fat intake or sometimes your sugar intake in your diet, even on a whole food plant based plant based diet. If you're eating processed foods or too much sweeteners, you, we can see numbers with that. Lowering fat intake. Can play. So there's certain things we can do to adjust a diet as well, um, based on each person, because people handle fat differently. And so even on a whole food plant-based diet, we'll adjust that as well. So hopefully those are some tips for you to start with. And then there's just some individuals who have genetically predisposition to have high cholesterol. So it's even more important that you do everything you can, that mm -hmm. you can modify for sure. And then that just on occasion, some people still need to be, have medications, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but that, that's just the way it is. And I would not. Okay, hopefully it's less and they're right. reducing all their other risks and they're exactly. reducing complications because they have such a healthful diet and lifestyle. Um, and so, but even this is interesting. Cholesterol is actually uh, a response to something going on in your body. And so, um, although it, the genetic one is when you're not, you're not getting rid of the cholesterol as well. Your receptors aren't as working, but it goes up acutely in response to things. So gaining weight, eating late at night. So doing things like intermittent fasting, being stressed out. And I've had patients come who are highly stressed and all of a sudden their numbers up and we talk about it after it's like, well, okay, what was going on here? And, um, often it's related to stress. We work on a mind body program and then we check it again in three months. I love following patients cholesterol in three months because it gives them that goal, something to work with. And so, <laughs> um, but then it, yeah, we can see it come down with related, like one patient, you know, you're supposed to fast overnight. And so one of my patients would work out in the morning before she came in, she did, she went out and worked out and all of a sudden it was significantly higher. And the exercise was just enough to raise it that little bit. So um, there's other factors too. So be, be mindful of your mind body and, and the stress that you're going on as well as exercising, changing diet and adding these supplements because they all do contribute. 
Yeah, and I just need to be careful with um, any type of red rice yeast just because that can, it can be damaging to the liver. So I'd avoid that if I was. Um, I know I don't use it a lot. I know some people do and I, but I don't because it's not FDA regulated and you sort of. Right. Don't know what's in. And you don't know what's in these supplements. So, cause these aren't regulated. So I, I'm is, very careful about that. No, it does have a statin. It has lowest statin in it, the same chemical. So you're going to mm-hmm. get risks as being on a statin. And if you do need it, then you might as well be on something that's regulated and we know how much it is. And we know it's, it's, um, that's sort of my feeling if I'm going to use it. But. Exactly. So let's see here. Um, got several questions. So Kristen, I know Kristen, she's like, she goes, are there um, specific recommendations for women with triple negative breast cancer versus ERPR positive breast cancer? I'm familiar with incorporating whole food plant-based diet, flaxseed, cruciferous vegetables, vitamin D. I wonder if there were other specific recommendations when you have triple negative breast cancer. Thanks for being pioneers in plant-based medicine online. So just from my own family risk factors, my mother had breast cancer, her mother and all their sisters, cousins have died. Um, So I'm ultra paranoid about that. The things that would be besides what she mentioned here would be soy products, um, tempeh, tofu, those type of things, edamames, and then also mushrooms. Mushrooms are significant to help um, more for the estrogen uh, positive, but for the triple negative, I mean, all you can do is literally just work on your diet and improve your lifestyle, sleep, stress, like you're saying that mind body experience is so very important. Um, but then you have to look at genetics and, you know, sometimes the genetics are just not in your favor. Um, but Chris, do you have any other thoughts there? You know, exactly what you said. So the whole food plant-based site, like for any breast cancer, um, I was also reading though, that for breast cancer, just in general, that it takes more significant exercise than just moderate exercise, moderate exercise, the 30 minutes a day, um, can help with many cancers, but for breast cancer, that needs to be actually a sweat, more intense exercise. So that was interesting. And then it's what Lori said too, and what you said, um, about increasing the phytoestrogen. So that's in your, your flax seeds, your green leafy vegetables, your soy products. Um, so I would do this, those same things. Yeah. That triple negative makes it a little bit tougher. And there is a good resource. Um, Dr. Christy Funk, she gives a lot of talks Mm. in the book. And um, she's someone who might be interesting to read about. Yeah, she, she, she wrote a book called Breast, the Owner's Manual. I have it right here. I've been trying to get her on the mm-hmm. podcast. So um, hope that helps, Kristen. That's a tough case there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one other question. So here, my husband has type 2 diabetes. He has been on metformin, uh, at ARB, and hydrochlorothiazide, and a statin. So an ARB is just a type of blood pressure medication. Um, he's not totally whole food plant based. She says, I am. He eats what I make. That's good. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll eat on an occasional chicken wrap, et cetera. I wonder if he still needs a hydrochlorothiazide. How can we determine that? I'm retired RN. He does not like me or to check his blood pressure. <laughs> he has always had white coat syndrome. Ma. Your thoughts? Um, well, I'm so glad this is kind of focusing back around what we want to talk about today is high blood pressure. So there's a thing called white coat hypertension that people get really nervous about someone doesn't even have to be in a white coat, but going to a medical practice and having someone's blood pressure checked, it can actually um, raise it because of the stress, which is exactly what we're talking about. So a couple of things. Number one, you shouldn't be diagnosing high blood pressure on a one time. Like if you go into your doctor and like, oh, your blood pressure is high, you know, unless it's really high or something. Um, but, you know, if they just the one time, like, yeah, we're going to search the meds. It should be over a period of two to three or more. And also maybe even, you know, there's ambulatory measuring of blood pressure, which is they hook you up to the little machine and it does it automatically for a period of 24 hours or something. Um, but then you can also check it at home. But you want to make sure your cuff is correct size, that it's up, up the, above the arm. You're holding your arm at heart level. And you should be checking it first in the arm that has typically the highest blood pressure, which is oftentimes the left side, but you want to check your blood pressure. Then after you've been sitting, no talking, resting in an upright position for about five minutes, that will give you an accurate blood pressure, not laying down, not after you're talking, not after you've been smoking or exercising or eating. You want to just, you know, give yourself half hour if you've been smoking or exercising or something, you want to be nice and calm. And that would be the first thing would be, you know, maybe you can get a blood pressure cuff to check for himself, it could be an automated one and then have him check his own blood pressure when nobody's around. That would be one thing for sure. I certainly, obviously being telehealth, I have to utilize. 
And the key here is it's just understand we don't know if he needs to stop it until we have data. So data is the key to making any accurate decision in medicine, I feel. Um, you can't just guess. You know, that's what the people, a lot of doctors we have struggles with our nutrition is that they're just telling you, oh, eat a low carb diet if you have type two diabetes. Well, that's really the opposite of what we should be eating. So I'm not talking about refined carbs, I'm talking about whole food carbs. And that's the unfortunate part is they're just guessing. They're just saying, well, this is what I've you know, heard or this is what they're doing, but it's not scientifically based. So I would encourage, again, check out, you know, plantbasedtelehealth.com, make an appointment with myself or Chris, uh, Dr. Muller, she would both be able to help you with that. And maybe speaking to someone outside the family um, is more important, even though you have the RN and you're very capable of checking blood pressures and guiding Sometimes the family, totally just, it's, it's got to be outside the family. Sure it's within the family. That's totally, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. Absolutely. It's so important. And then if he's still, um, you know, if he's still a type two diabetic, there may be some things that we can encourage him to do to reverse the diabetes if possible. Um, and then, you know, look at the statin and his other risk factors in the ARB. And so there may be a, and the statin may be falsely raising some of his blood sugar. So there's some other things there to consider that he would be a perfect patient for us. So <laughs> Todi, I hope you check that out because yeah. that's- and um, I would add, remember that when someone has um, white coat hypertension, then, so that means that your thoughts and the stress of checking blood pressure are raising it. So your thoughts, when you put yourself in your happy place in a calming place, I actually can lower it by, I've seen it up to as much as 10 um, points um, systolic that it changes. And this, you can kind of make it like a game. And this is what I do with my patients. So they'll sit down and I'll get a blood pressure on them while they're talking to me. Oh, Dr. Miller, blah, 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 whatever's going on. And we're getting a blood pressure. And I know it's gonna be high because they're talking. What Lori said, it shouldn't be high. Uh, I mean, you shouldn't be talking. You should be sitting and resting and breathing and calm. So as they're talking to me, I'm trying to get a blood pressure and they're still talking. And so um, it's gonna be high. So then I sit them down quietly and I say, go to your happy place. Where's your happy place? Go there right now. So I, we're not talking. I just give them that few minutes to calm down, to be in that happy place. It almost always drops by 10 points. And so, um, or, or, or whatever, that's the most, something between zero and 10 points, it'll drop in many people. And so play with that with your husband, make it kind of fun or have it be like a game or see what the effects are. Can he recalm it down by going to that happy place? And um, it really does matter. And actually white coat hypertension is now proven to be a risk factor. So if it is high um, with that, that you, that's something you do want to pay attention. Then you want to work more on a mind body program. Um, and so, so there's a lot of little tricks in addition to everything else that you said, Lori, that I like to play with, with my patients and kind of make it a little more fun. And I'll often do a challenge with my patients. So if their goal is to lower blood pressure and they don't, they feel like they're getting the, the side effects of the medications, they don't want to be on them. Their, their goal is to work towards needing less medications over time, then let's do a challenge. Let's maybe we can, whatever, wherever he is in his diet right now, can he step it up for 30 days? What is he willing to do for 30 days? doing these mind-body activities, having a fun with checking his blood pressure, monitoring it to get the data like Lori was saying. And at the end of 30 days, oftentimes people will start to see results. And then you can do another challenge, 30 days and step it up even more, like without going crazy or feeling like overcommitted or, oh my God, there's no way I could do this, but find out where he is right now and what could he step up and watch because it really matters. The power of food and lifestyle it's so powerful. So if he commits to something, it's almost likely that he's going to see some change and then want to keep going. So hopefully that will help you and him and get inspired. Absolutely. And I, it's been really interesting. I had one patient, um, it was really fascinating. Stress and anxiety would drive up her blood pressure and we were, ha we're just having the heck of a time getting it down. So I taught her the four, seven, eight breathing, which we know we've talked about and you're very familiar with because Dr. Wheel and and in Arizona. Um, but what that is, it's, you know, you're, it's, it's just meditative breathing in a sense that you're, you're going to do this in four cycles. You breathe in over four, you hold your breath for seven and you breathe out over eight. And her blood pressure, no kidding. I would check it beforehand and we check it again after doing that breathing dropped 15 points to sell. <laughs> It's the most amazing thing ever. And you, there's lots of reasons for that. There's certain, you know, parts of the nervous system that are actually engaged and those deep breaths, your stress is, de is decreasing because you're focusing on the counting and the breathing. So again, there's lots of things like that. that and it works. triggers your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is the rest and repair and dilates blood vessels. So that's, 
Yeah, that's a wonderful technique to teach people. So, so we should do a whole session on breathing techniques and we'll practice together. So at the end, we'll all be so calm and we should check our, all of our blood pressure at the beginning and the end. So check your pulse too. And we're all yeah. drop. If you don't fall asleep, don't do this while you're driving. Yeah. We don't want you falling asleep. <laughs> that sounds, and then that sounds, I bet we get more people come for that. That'll be a fun session we all get to do together. Exactly. <laughs> well, Tody mentioned something else. I, Tody, I would love for you just to mention, maybe have him watch this. I really think that we could maybe talk to him about some of the side effects of those medications that he's on, and that might encourage him to come off them a little bit more. So we should definitely have a nice conversation. So, yeah, we can um, try to help. Kit mentioned intermittent fasting increases cholesterol. No, it um, decreases no, it. No, it decreases it. Maybe it was something that we might have misunderstood. If you eat late no. at night, it increases yeah. all your inflammatory markers, of which cholesterol is one of them. That's why people yeah. in general, want, we want to do an eight to 12 hour fast. But um, in general, if people intermittent fast, um, and I have some patients with some tough high cholesterol issues, and um, we work on more intermittent fasting with them. And so over time, we see even more of a significant uh, lowering of their cholesterol with that trick. So yeah, so it's a good one to play with for some people. Okay. And then we have a question about juicing. Um, what about having juicing? I feel like having carrot juice with apples and celery is this bad. She wants to improve our um, eyesight health. So Chris, I know certainly has some experience with juicing and it's helped her a lot with some of the lupus. I just encourage, unless you have a specific need like Chris did, um, to incorporate instead doing smoothies. You can do those same things. Just try to keep the fiber and more of the nutrients, you know, cause there are some things stuck to that fiber that you're gonna lose as you discard it. And so that would be my, always my encouragement, but unless you have special GI issues or certain things that like Chris, if you probably should be able to answer that much better cause you've dove into that much more than I have. Um, I think it depends on the person, like, like you were saying, Lori, um, totally. So as someone who's diabetic or trying to lose weight, I probably wouldn't use juices as a first way to add in. Um, but if you are someone who, you're, if you're working on your eye health and you have a whole food plant-based diet and you're eating plenty of micronutrients and fiber, to add about eight ounces of a vegetable juice, and it, um, it needs to be a vegetable juice, but to add eight ounces of that once or even twice a day can really amp up the amount of nutrients that you're getting and getting it pretty quick. You wanna be real careful though, if you're eating both carrots and apples, both of those are gonna be higher glycemic. So you wanna keep it a lower glycemic. So it's really three to one of um, low glycemic vegetables such as cucumber, celery, lettuces. Um, those are low glycemic to one of maybe a green apple, maybe a little bit of carrot, maybe a little bit of beet, if you're trying to get the color, maybe a few strawberries, but you use just a little bit of that in one to three ratio. More than that, it's going to probably spike your blood sugar a little bit too much. So um, yep. yeah, and then you can play with it and have all sorts of fun with making a juice. But I do think it has a role and you can um, get extra nutrients from that, especially some people are struggling with getting their nutrients. But you want to do your juice usually with um, a fiber-based meal in general, which will be even more beneficial. But, Absolutely. And... Okay. Another question was, what time should we our blood sugars be checked? Um, typically, when you're checking your blood sugars, if you're a diabetic, you your fasting blood sugar in the morning is a great start, but it depends. So if you're on insulin, you're going to be checking it maybe before meals and maybe two hours um, after. You may be checking it before bedtime. So it really depends on the severity of your diabetes. Um, are you on medications? Are you type 1, type 2, or and are you on insulin specifically, or oral hypoglycemics, which are different from the metformin. It's a little bit different, works a little different. So those are things to consider, and everyone's a definite individual. I'm a huge fan of the continuous glucose monitor. It mm -hmm. has been fabulous. It's so much fun working with patients. I have four of them hooked up right now with my patients on my telehealth, and they are the coolest thing. They're uploading all their data. You can see percentage above where our goal is and what they're doing when they're injecting, what they're eating. Oh my goodness. It is like a minefield for joy for me. Just like, yes, let's narrow in on this. You know, they're not having to poke themselves. So I'd say if you're really struggling with your blood sugars, you know, 
again, make an appointment, check us out, or talk to your doctor about it, getting continuous glucose monitor and really focusing on what's going on with your blood sugar and learning how your body responds to certain foods, like the juicing or something like that. So, And the continuous glucose monitor, it's not as scary as it might sound. I have patients who are kind of worried about it, but you just stick it to your arm and you follow it on your phone with an app. And so it's not invasive, like it seems like it might be. Um, and your doctor prescribes it. We can prescribe it through PB Telehealth mm -hmm. or your doctor can prescribe it for you and insurance will cover it. So um, yep, depending absolutely. on your insurance. So, um, it's really good tool. Lori, when in general do you recommend if someone doesn't know if they're diabetic and they just want to check it, how do you recommend that person just kind of, what time of day or do you have a preference? Or I would say probably a fasting blood sugar in the morning is, would be the most reliable. Um, That's what it's I did really, too, I Yeah, sure. I think it's, it's fairly interesting because I wore the continuous glucose monitor for almost two weeks. Um, and then just got to the point, I, it was like seeing the same patterns because I pretty much eat the same. <laughs> but it was really interesting to see you know, the spike and the drop and exercise, and it goes up a little bit. Um, but it was a really neat thing. So there's a few different continuous glucose monitors on the market. Uh, the one I like is the Freestyle Libre. It's cheaper. And you can get the free app, the reader, um, as an app downloaded to your phone. And they have a thing called Libre View, um, which is where you're connecting. And there's some Dexcons and stuff. They tend to be more expensive, but they have an alert. So if you're of a type 1 or you have a brittle diabetic, those are really nice because you can set where you can actually get set an alert. If you're turning down very quickly, someone needs to maybe eat something before they become hypoglycemic and actually symptomatic. So there's so many things to do to get your diabetes on track and really feel well. Type one, one and a half, type two, gestational diabetes. There's, I, it's just, it's so amazing. It's just amazing. So, so fun, right? So <laughs> it fun. is so much fun. It's fun to help people get better. Um, so we had another question. Okay. Oh, do you have recommendations for cholangiocarcinoma, a rare bile duct cancer? Oof. I'll let you go ahead and start that one, maybe just as cancer in general, because I don't know specifics yeah, to that it's one. Rare, it's rare enough that um, it's not something we see all the time. So I would just do general cancer recommendations. So a whole food plant-based diet, removing foods that we know promote cancer and turn on cancer genes, such as dairy products, animal products, um, really enhancing raw vegetables and fruit. That's the sort of the staple hallmark for, he for helping um, with an anti-cancer diet prevention and um, uh, trying to halt it and, and who knows, sometimes even reverse certain cancers. I can't speak specifically to that one though, but so it's really increasing the raw greens. And that is someone that I would have do raw um, vegetable juices, especially making sure they get the greens in there. Um, just, just a little bit each day. It doesn't need to be a ton, but then, um, uh, things like seeds, like especially flax and chia seeds, things like legumes, all your beans are going to be very beneficial. Things like berries, onions and garlic, mushrooms, those same things that support the immune system that we've been talking about are really going to support the immune system again to help with the cancer. Removing things like sugar um, and processed foods and being mindful of toxins in the environment, like what kind, what's in your drinking water, what's the indoor, outdoor pollution of the air where you live. Um, all those things are going to play a role. Um, so I would just, oh, and then exercise, stress reduction, of course, sleep, because your body's healing during that. And that's really important. There's so much with, with renewing and regenerating ourselves, how we restore ourselves that really matters. So how we move, how we sleep, how we play, how we connect, um, how much gratitude we have whether we're holding grudges on people. There's a lot of evidence with all of that really affecting the immune system. And I know I personally have had to work on that a lot in addition to my diet. So um, really building a comprehensive integrated plan, which is something I try to help with my patients. So we build a comprehensive integrated plan that is from, from what they're eating to how they're restoring and re re revitalizing themselves to how they're moving, how they're sleeping, how they're living, all the, everything that's in their life and try to really get on track. But for that one specifically, Lori, I don't know. I don't, I guess I don't know specifically mm, about that. Not that I'm aware of this. It's exactly what you're saying. So that's where I would say you want to optimize your health as best you can. Um, so incorporating all those things that you described, your diet, your stress, your sleep, your exercise. And so that when you do have treatment that you'll respond more properly, you'll recover more. Um, and I've certainly seen that in patients of mine who 
have gone through chemo radiation and they went to a whole food plant-based diet, they just did so much better than they probably would have continued eating, you know, standard American diet. And sometimes, you know, I, I had to be careful what I say, but sometimes you'll hear advice from medical professionals to eat, just eat enough calories because you're a cancer. I don't agree with that. I said, well, you eat the right calories. <laughs> I know, <laughs> so, I agree. Yeah. I, I'm with you on that one, Lori. Like it worries me when they just want them eating like a milk based drink when that's going to mm-hmm. promote cancer or giving them ice cream. Cause that's all that they want. I'm not, cause that is the sugar and that is going to promote cancer. So right. um, I'm totally with you on that, but there is actually, there's some good evidence. Um, and yeah, when we work with patients who have um, a chemo induced type things like neuropathies or um, peripheral edema, the swelling in the legs, um, so there is some evidence actually that a whole food plant-based diet and the lifestyle factors actually play a role. So, um, that's something to, that's even more important that you're addressing those. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I agree 100% yeah, on that. I hope that's um, somewhat helpful. Yes. And so here's another question. Um, oh, well, we have two questions. Uh, Kristen, sorry, I missed that question earlier. Um, she's asking about, um, the Winky Bach. I think that's how we say it. it's a it's actually a type of heart block. Um, I was asking if it's the same as AFib. It's not um, diet. I'm not re- I'm not aware of helping that. Um, I'm not aware. Typically, of it it's more of a structural issue versus yeah. um, a dietary electrolyte issue type thing. So, and know. although it's still good to optimize your diet and your always and your whole <laughs> your, heart function and your blood vessel function, so right. there is benefit, but. I don't know that it will reverse that because it's a structure. No, no, not at all. Um, another question, I am whole food plant-based and what causes acid reflux? You want to dive in first? Yeah, so um, acid reflux is very interesting um, because it's so common for one. People don't even often tell me about it when they come to see, or you're probably the same thing, tell us about it as patients because it's so common, but um, it can be caused from a lot of things. So acid is in the stomach and it's made uh, in order to help digest food. It plays a very important role actually. You need the acid to break down your food. It's part of the digestion. The first step of digestion happens in your mouth with chewing and then with the digestive enzymes. And then the acid in your stomach is gonna help further break down um, your foods. So it's important for that. It's also important though, in that it prevents bacterial or viral infections. So if you were to eat something that's been exposed to something, say either food poisoning or some other contaminant, the acid actually deactivates some of that. And so that's why there's evidence now that people on proton pump inhibitors have more pneumonias because some of the acid, um, you're not, the acid's not there anymore. And so you're not getting rid of the bacteria that's in from the food. So, um, so acid plays a very important role and um, it has to do a lot with the type of food you're eating. So when people aren't eating fiber rich foods, fiber isn't moving through the gut very, very efficiently. Um, and so it moves kind of slower and it has more chance of backing up. It has to do with um, if people sort of people are eating the low fiber foods like meats and dairies and processed foods, that is basically a standard American diet, which has no fiber in it. And so we'll see that um, pressure backing up. If people have something like diabetes where their gut isn't peristalsing and moving through um, the way it's supposed to, or they're constipated, then that's also going to back up and they're going to see more reflux. If people are eating late at night um, and they're eating fattier foods, that is going to relax the um, esophageal sphincter, which is supposed to be holding the acid in the stomach. And so um, when they eat late at night or they lay down or they're eating high fat foods or things like certain foods that relax it, um, the sphincter, they'll, they'll have more heartburn. So um, all what's been really interesting in our practice is that it responds really well to changing a diet. Actually, within one to three days, people can feel significantly better in something that they've had for their whole lives. So um, it's really impressive how just adding the fiber and taking out those fiber less high fat foods and a little bit altering the time that they're eating, that it's such a dramatic response. And, um, and then we can taper, slowly taper off medications if they're on PPS. I tend to do that slowly because people can sometimes get rebound heartburn if you do it too quickly. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it, that one actually is really responsive to diet changes. So hopefully that's something that you are doing or working with or um, to get the benefits of that. I would agree. And then some of the antacids actually contain sodium. 
which will drive up blood pressure as well. So exactly, then you can come off medications that might be causing secondary uh, problems like high blood pressure or you know, all sorts also, of you know, digestion the, issues. Those medications also prevent um, you from absorbing nutrients as well. And so mm -hmm. people that are on PPIs um, will also be deficient in things like magnesium, calcium, um, iron we'll see sometimes. And so this, and even B12. if you're in diet, yeah, B12, thank you. I knew there was another one. And so the, it's really important that you pay extra attention to those nutrients and then you're at high risk pneumonias. And then this may shouldn't be high risk of, of heart attacks, in fact, from that as well, from those as well. And so those medications were designed to be used for eight weeks or less acutely. So if someone has an acute bleed or something going on, those medications are there and they're, they can play an important role but it somehow became over the counter and people are on it for, for indefinitely. And that's where they're getting into trouble. So um, really working with the diet and the lifestyle. And then there are some herbs that can be helpful. They can kind of coat it. They're like demulsifier, they're called. And they kind of coat the stomach. And I'll often use that with some people too while we're tapering off their medications and they're switching their diet to whole food plant-based. If they're not getting a full response or as quickly as we want, we'll use the herbs as well, which can be helpful. So there's a lot that we can do for that one. So hopefully, hopefully that helps you get on the right pathway. Fantastic in-depth answer. So I do want to wrap up just by kind of going over back to the hypertension and things that we can do that are you can modify in your life to reduce your blood pressure. So these are going to be things that you've probably heard. One is weight loss. Um, for every kilogram of weight loss, which is 2.2 pounds, you can think to look, you're going to probably lose one point on your blood pressure. Um, of course, removing alcohol, you know, excessive alcohol use can do that. Um, keeping to a low sodium diet, which is 15 milligrams is what their recommendations are. 1500 milligrams. Yeah, 1500 milligrams. And then seriously, that is really, you're going to get sodium naturally in the plant foods. But the thing is, it's really hard to do when you're not eating processed foods, you're just strictly eating whole plant foods and you're not adding salt to your cooking and things like that. The other thing is exercise. There's aerobic exercise. There's also resistance exercise. Both of those are very beneficial. You want to aim to like 150 minutes per week with those. Of course, stopping smoking. <laughs> That's huge. If you're smoking, I don't know what else we need to say, but please stop. And, you know, there's some other things that you can incorporate into the diet. Um, if you're not already eating a whole plant-based diet is thinking about high potassium foods. So potassium around between 3,500 milligrams to 5,000 milligrams per day can actually blunt some of the sodium effects too. So this, you know, low potassium diet is going to put you at higher risk for high blood pressure. So make sure you're eating potassium rich foods. And then in addition to that, what can you be eating? Of course, ground flaxseed also helps with breast cancer risk, but a quarter cup a day is you can spread it out through the day, however you like. Freshly ground is great. Um, high nitrate foods like your greens, arugula, beets, beet greens, um, uh, there's all sorts of uh, lettuces, rhubarb, cilantro, you name it. Greens are good for you. Beet juice in particular is really interesting. Half a cup um, a day. And then hibiscus tea, you know, a cup with every meal is very helpful. And um, you know, there's just so many things that we can add into our life that's going to benefit not just your high blood pressure, but also many other things. But Chris, do you have any other additions to that? No, that, that's an awesome, that's an awesome um, assessment of it. So other things that I work on with patients is um, in addition to everything that Lori just said, which I totally agree with, um, sometimes for people, if it's safe for you to do high intensity exercise can actually help a little bit too with lowering blood pressure a little further. So even just doing something like 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for like three minutes, um, if it's safe for you to do that. So I don't know everyone's cardiovascular risk history, but if it's safe for you to do that and your joints will tolerate it, that can be helpful. And you can just do like jumping jacks for 20 seconds and then, you know, walk in place for 10 seconds, something simple in your house. Um, and then I do, let's see, green or white tea can be beneficial for lowering blood pressure in some people. Um, cocoa or cacao, the unsweetened, basically just adding like the, the raw powder can be helpful because um, it's a vasodilator similar to like those green leafy vegetables that you were talking about. And then of course, all the mind body stuff, which I can't ever stress that enough. So back to that four, seven, eight breathing or the five, five breathing, um, going to your happy place, meditating, yoga, um, all of those things are good. Walking outside, grounding, rewalking grass, forest bathing, all of that is calming down your nervous system. 
and will help lower blood pressure as well. Um, sauna therapy has been shown to help lower blood pressure. So an infrared sauna, regular sauna um, can be another tool that people use. And intermittent fasting can also be helpful. So not eating late at night and trying to give yourself 12 to 14 hours where you, if you stop eating by 6 or 7 p.m. and you don't eat them the next morning until say 8 a.m., you're going to give yourself um, 13, 14 hours. And that's tremendous. That can actually help lower blood pressure as well. Um, and everyone's going to be different. So yeah, that's, it depends on how, what type of blood pressure and how, what's, what's been going on in their lives. So some people will lower and I think, Lori, we are going to touch on this. Some people's blood pressure will lower right away dramatically and fast. So these dietary and lifestyle changes we're talking about are so powerful. It's more powerful than any medication I've ever seen. And I'm sure you yes, feel the same way. Absolutely. So if you're on medications, you have to be monitoring it. You have to be cutting back aggressively. And that's what we've been helping people with in our practice um, to cut back the meds so it doesn't get unsafe because you can get lightheaded, pass out, fall, hit your head, um, have all sorts of problems or, or even have a heart attack or kidney issues from your um, blood pressure being too low acutely um, if you've changed your diet and, and you don't make the appropriate changes. So um, it's a dramatic um, effect that the diet and lifestyle has. So just being mindful of that and monitoring it and having someone help you if you're on medications. Um, exactly. Because so. it'll depend too on what medications you're on. So some are much stronger than others, how high your blood pressure is, how quickly you're responding. So maybe we cut it down three quarters, maybe we cut it in half, and we may do that over a period of a week to two weeks. So this is really where it's important to have medical guidance in someone who's um, experienced in de-prescribing medications. That's mm -hmm. not something that we got to medical school to learn to do. We learn to prescribe, but not de-prescribe. So super important that you're being monitored closely, because one of the things that you want to look for, if you transition to the whole food plant-based diet and you are already, you know, on blood pressure medications and you start, you feel good those first, you know, three, four days a week. And suddenly you have this onset of dizziness with standing. So that's what we call orthostatic hypotension. I mean, that as a change of position, your blood pressure will drop because typically your blood pressure, your vessels will go, Oh, she's standing. I need to squeeze, get the blood to the brain. Um, you know, get the blood to the muscles as we're moving that can be an issue when you're taking something, a pill that lowers your blood pressure. So that's one thing. The other thing is you feel dizzy and suddenly very fatigued. Um, you were feeling great and then like, well, now I'm just, I have no energy. You have to take a nap, you have yeah. to sit down. These are very, very, very important things, especially if you're doing outside work and you're, you're dehydrated and you're not staying well hydrated. There's so many factors involved here. So please, either us or your doctor, um, just make sure that you're being followed carefully. And the other thing, just to keep in mind, kind of goes back to that question that we had earlier. She said, oh, on occasion, he'll eat a chicken wrap. Well, chicken is a horrendous harbor of high sodium because what happens is they, remember, meat is sold by pounds, by weight. So what they'll do is they'll actually inject, so, <laughs> I, I, you can't make this stuff up. They inject salt water to in, inflate the the weight so they can sell it uh, more of it. Um, so chicken is not a healthy option, guys. Um, people are like, oh, I eat more chicken. No, stop. <laughs> so, you know, that's just some other considerations. Um, there was another question here real quick. It'll be our last question. Uh, so we want to keep this to an hour to kind of be mindful of everybody's time. And um, Robin asked, she heard an advertisement from a doctor lake either lake or lakey about dermal repair complex consisting of hyaluronic acid sal palmetto and some collagen is this rejuvenating skin or joint care and i know i have my thoughts on these type of supplements that people are are pushing but chris go ahead if you want to i don't have much to say i don't really use or recommend that a lot um i know things like um, collagen, I don't typically recommend because that's just amino acids that your body can build itself. And by eating a, a healthier diet that vasodilates, I try to work more to increase blood flow to the skin and make sure they have all the nutrients through a colorful, um, antioxidant rich, nutrient dense diet. So I don't use a lot of that. So I guess I don't really have much that I can say. Yeah. And I'm always wary when people are saying high potency this or high potency that or doing this. One, we don't know what's in it. It's not FDA regulated. People can make outrageous claims. So 
You know, there are a few supplements that we recommend, B12, vitamin D, maybe omega-3s, depending on the individual. But again, these are individual, everyone should be taking B12 on a plant-based diet. No excuses, and that's just what you need to do. Um, but, you know, vitamin D, maybe your level's okay. Maybe you don't need the omega-3s. Again, these are, these are things that depend, iodine, you know, K2. But these are actually, because the diet may not have sufficient quantities if you're not eating certain types of plant foods. So again, when you see someone touting, you know, um, lectin inhibitors or something crazy like that, these are, there's typically a reason behind that. So I'm always wary. And so don't, let's not look for shortcuts with supplements, but let's look at just supplements to make an already super healthy diet that much better and it doesn't take much. There's just a few things that we look at. So I would say always be wary, look and in, dive into the science if you're really curious. But honestly, I just typically just keep on strolling. Life's too busy to be drawn into these type of claims. And remember any high potency, anything, an herb, a supplement <laughs> can be dangerous. You can even drink too much water, drink too quickly and it lowers your sodium. So too much of anything can not be good. So just be very, very wary um, and careful. So, you know, we don't, we want to, we don't want to fall victim to these type of uh, marketing schemes. And that being said, if it's your primary doctor or your doctor recommending it, then I would, yeah, def definitely look into the research before I would tell you to stop it, but just be cautious. Yeah. Be cautious or ask another physician um, their recommendations for sure. And then, so that's completely reasonable. So. I think we've answered all the questions and you guys have been a great audience. So yeah, we thank so you appreciate for the fun it. questions, you guys. I hope we talk, got you understanding a little bit about high blood pressure and everything else. Absolutely. And we'll be back next Thursday, same time, same place. And we're signing off. Don't forget plantbasedtelehealth.com. If you need a plant-based doc, please share um, to your friends and family about us. And we really appreciate you guys being part of our community. Thank <laughs> you.